Hi, Pastor Steve here. I want to thank you for listening today, and I want to encourage you because I know that God will truly bless you as you study His Word. So hey, let's get started. Good morning and welcome to Lawrence Heights Christian Church. At this time, let's all stand together as we worship.
Some of you may remember my last meditation. Uh, I kind of explained how Jesus had literally fulfilled all, every one of the 351 Old Testament prophecies concerning the returning of the Messiah. Well, today we'll call this part two, okay? Little explanation. Uh, I want to explain that Jesus' entire life was full of amazing coincidences, or what I like to call God incidents. Let's talk about the last day of Jesus' life. The Bible tells us that he died on a Friday, right? Well, when does Friday begin? In the Jewish religion. Well, Friday actually begins at sunset on Thursday, right? And it runs till sunset on Friday. So his last day began at sunset and ended at sunset on Friday. And it just so happens that Passover started that very same time. Isn't that amazing? Just a coincidence, right? And that's why Jesus and his disciples were in the upper room breaking bread. They were preparing for Passover. Another coincidence. Another coincidence is that each year the high priest's practice of killing the Passover lamb had been in force for hundreds of years. On Passover Friday of each year, the Jews killed the first lamb as the temple sacrifice. Jesus, the Lamb of God, also died at that same time in order to take our sins upon himself forever. So his last day began as the sun set over Jerusalem, and that's when it all began, when everything turned towards his suffering and his death. It all began at sunset with the meal with the apostles in the upper room, he then went to the Garden of Gethsemane, where he was betrayed, and they arrested him and brought him to the priests, who put him on trial and condemned him to death. Friday morning, they took him to Pontius Pilate. He was then beaten, mocked, scourged, and led through the streets of Jerusalem to be nailed to the cross. There he suffered for hours. And then finally said, it is finished, and he died. They then took his body down and laid it at, in a tomb as the sun set over Jerusalem. That's in scripture. Mark 15, 42 tells us that it all took place in that exact period of time, from sunset on Thursday to sunset on Friday, and Jewish tradition also forced them to have him put into the tomb before sunset on Friday. Why? Because the following day was the Sabbath, and you can't have a corpse laying around on the Sabbath. So Jesus just so happened to have accomplished all of this on the sixth day because Friday is also the sixth day of the week, is it not? Why is that significant? What day was man created in Genesis? The sixth day. Just another coincidence, by the way, right? The sixth day of the Jewish week. So it was the day of man as well as the feast of Passover. Another just big coincidence. He died for the sins of man, the guilt of man, the fall of man, 
and he presented himself as the final sacrificial lamb once and for all to atone for all of our sins forever. He did it all on the day of man to accomplish man's redemption. It was also on the sixth day because man was given life on that day originally, and now we have all been given newness of life on the same day. Just another coincidence. God is sovereign, is my point here. Everything that God does has been planned from the beginning of time and has its purpose fulfilled down to the minutest detail. This is not a coincidence, it is a God incident. As we partake of these emblems this morning, I want us all to realize that Jesus' sacrifice and death is utmost of importance to each and every one of us. We just need to understand how much he loved us and gave of himself for every one of us and it was all done out of love. So as we participate, the people will come with the communion cups. There are two cups, one on top of the other. If you've never been here before, be careful because the bread is in the bottom cup, the juice is on the top, and we will pass these around, so you just make sure you get both of them. There are also rings in the chairs in front of you. When you're done, just put those down in the bottom of the chairs so that they don't spill. And uh, with that, let's pray this morning. Father, we do thank you and praise you that we have the opportunity to participate in communion each and every Sunday. Father, we know how much you love us. We want you to know how much we love you. So as we partake of these emblems, help each one of us to remember just who you are in each one of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.
is a great day to be in the house of the Lord. Amen? Amen. Amen. Once again, good morning to you, church. It's great to see you. And those of you who are following along online, we want to extend a warm welcome to you as well. Thank you for joining us on this platform. And if you happen to be a guest here in the house, we want to extend a very special welcome to you. And before they get very far, let's show our appreciation for our praise team one more time, leading us in worship today. You know, the Bible uses words like body and family and challenges each of us to be an active part. So listen, regardless of your background or your current situation, you need to know that we really believe there's a place here that's perfect for you. This is a place where you can belong and use your talents to glorify Christ. And speaking of family, I am thrilled to invite a very special family to come forward at this time. Sean and Becca Gordon are bringing their daughter, Lily, to be dedicated here today. Come on up, guys. Let's give them a warm welcome. Now, I was talking with Becca this week. This is a particularly special moment, not just for them, but for me as well. Today, many of you know, marks my 18th year in ministry here at Lawrence Heights. And the thing I love most, second only to baptisms, baby dedications. And I told the Sean and Becca here, I told their family that if baby dedications were an Olympic event, they would be gold medalists. <laughs> because as you can see, this is their fourth precious little one that I have had the privilege of dedicating to the Lord. Now, if you're new here to Lawrence Heights, you need to know that we don't practice water baptism for infant baptism for, for children with the sprinkling, but we do dedicate them to the Lord because we know what a precious gift they are. And Sean and Becca, I have one question for you. Do you guys remember the time we were praying in my office, even before Huck was conceived? What a time that we cried together and prayed together. And today, as I was just driving here this morning, I was just praising God for this wonderful gift, the way he has bestowed a beautiful family to you. And if you don't know their testimony, you need to know that... Uh, Becca faces a, a very serious autoimmune disorder called Graves' disease. And so with each child, it puts her at tremendous risk, tremendous flare-ups, and tremendous illnesses. But she is standing here before you today saying, it is so worth it. Amen? Amen. Let's praise God for this. Thank you. Now listen, as their church family, this baby dedication is more of a church dedication, a parent dedication, where we are going to be praying over Lily. We're agreeing to partner with them in this journey to be there to encourage and to challenge and to instruct. We're to be there to help encourage Sean and Becca as well, every step of the way, in good days and bad. And that's what we're going to do. So I'm going to ask you to stretch forward your hand as if you're able to just lay hands directly here on Lily and Sean and Becca and their entire family. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this day. Lord, we thank you for Lily's life. We thank you for her big brother, Huck, and her big sisters, Evelyn and Grace. Lord, we thank you for the, each time the miracles that you have worked to just have them here today. Lord, we thank you for Becca's health that's made it possible for her to be here today. And Lord, we thank you for the steadfastness of, of Sean, and how he has been a tremendous godly leader and a godly example through this all. Lord, they come today in obedience to you. Lord, they are dedicating this precious child, Lily, into your hands. We know she's a precious gift that comes from you, a treasure. And Lord, we dedicate her, we commit her into your hands. We pray that you would cause her to grow in the wisdom and knowledge of who you are and your son, Jesus. And Lord, we dedicate ourselves here. We consecrate ourselves to be here for Lily every step of the way and for this family. Lord, help us as a church to pour into her and to love on her every step of the way. We pray this together in Jesus' name and all together in unity. The church said, amen, amen. amen. We have a little gift that we'd like to give you as well. Let's give them a warm round of applause.
Now, in our time of Bible study today, folks, we're going to be continuing on in our journey walking through the Gospel of Mark together. So if you've got your Bible nearby, maybe your mobile device with your Bible app, I'm going to encourage you to begin making your way to Mark chapter 9, there on the New Testament side of your Bible. As we begin chapter 9 today, we're actually going to be getting a whole new section of the Gospel of Mark. So far, we've been asking and we've been answering the question, who is Jesus? And today... And for a while now, we're going to begin, at, begin to discover how Jesus changes everything. In fact, just stop for a moment and think about the highs and lows of life. Some of you, when you came in here today, you came after maybe a mountaintop experience this past week. While others of us, if we're honest, maybe we're feeling like we're more down in the valley. Either way, listen, you've come at the perfect time as we watch Jesus actually transform those highs and those lows of life. So Mark chapter 9 is where we're going to be camping out today. Now, by way of announcement, something you need to be aware of, be sure that you're here two weeks from today in person on August 15th because three very important things, very special things, are going to be happen, happening that day. First off, Pastor Robert is going to be preaching that day. That's always a blessing. But two other very important things are also going to happen that day. As school starts back up all throughout the area for the fall semester, we want to pray for our students and our teachers alike, and as well as administrative staff, whether you're part of a public school setting or private school setting or a home school setting or even the university setting, just know that we love you. We want to pray God's blessing and protection on you as this fall semester begins. And then last but not least, I'm also excited to announce that our elders want to take a few minutes that day to share a wonderful opportunity that we have, a wonderful plan to address the much needed repairs to our parking lot and our sidewalks. I'm sure you noticed on your way in that we got some spots that are treacherous and they need to be replaced and repaired. So obviously this is such a big ticket item that we're gonna carve out some special time to serve as a congregational meeting to share that opportunity that we have we finally have to remedy that problem. And in accordance with our church bylaws, we're giving two weeks advance notice ahead of that meeting. So please, please, please be sure to be here on the 15th. Also keep in mind that we've got lots of opportunities to volunteer and serve right here on Sunday mornings. We are called to be so much more than consumers or spectators. And God has gifted each of us with abilities and talents to bless each other and minister to one another. So if you're not currently serving anywhere, hey, Here's your opportunity. Here's your invitation. Just see me or any of the staff after this service, and we'll be delighted to get you plugged right in. Well, I think it's in the way of major announcements anyway, so at this time, what do you say we go to the Lord in prayer? Let's ask him to bless our hearts and our minds as we study his word together. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we're so eager to hear from you today. For some of us, this past week really was a tremendous mountaintop experience where we encountered excitement and joy at the peak. But others of us, Lord, if we're honest, we've been down in the valley where we've experienced heartache and grief or discouragement or loneliness. And some of us, Lord, we've experienced the peak and the valley all in the same day. So either way, Father, I pray and I ask right now that you would turn our eyes and turn our hearts to see Jesus right now. Be at work in each and every one of us by the power of your Holy Spirit to shape and to mold us into the church that you would have us to be for your glory in Jesus' name. And again in unity, the church said, amen, amen. Well, we do it all the time. We obsess, we focus on the highest of highs and the lowest of lows in life. Every year we reflect, what were the best moments in sports? What were the best movies? What were the best songs? What were the best investments in the stock market? And it's not just the highs, is it? No, we also try to gauge the worst moments of the year, the worst songs of the year, or the worst movies, or the worst moments in sports. The Olympics have been going on this past week, and so many of us are obsessed with the thrill of victory and the agony of defeat. So many of us just expected to see Simone Biles atop the podium again this year, but we all saw how years and years of training and practice could just be wiped away in a single moment, and it's devastating. So the question is, why do we obsess on the highs and the lows of life? Well, maybe it's because when we see other people experiencing their highs and lows in life, well, it can kind of help us process the highs and lows that we experience in life. Life really is a roller coaster, isn't it? 
And sometimes you're way up here, sometimes you're way down here, and sometimes it feels like you're doing this a few times, right? One moment, the high high of life, like, guess what? She said yes to the low lows of life of she left me. Or the high highs of, hey, we're having a boy or we're having a girl to the devastating news of another miscarriage. We all have these super highs and these super lows. And if we're really honest here in church, most of us just want to have a life that's filled with nothing but all the highs without any of the lows. Now, do you guys know what that's called? That's called heaven. And if you're a Christian, if you've placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, well, you're certainly going to go there. But listen, this ain't it. This is not heaven, but here on earth, Jesus is going to help us to frame what we do with those highs and lows of life. Last week, if you're here with us, you know he was talking with the disciples about the highs and lows. He was talking with them about what it means to follow him. But this week now, the disciples are actually going to experience the highs and lows all within a 24-hour period of time. How many of you know there's a big difference between just talking about the highs and lows and actually experiencing the highs and lows? Yeah, this is what the disciples are going to experience in our passage today. So where we last left off in Mark chapter 8, Jesus said to his disciples, Hey, guys, listen, some of you, before you die, you're going to see the kingdom of God come in power and glory. So there's this anticipation. Some of the disciples have been promised some kind of moment of revelation, some kind of moment of glory. And so here in Mark chapter 9, beginning again in verse 2, six days after that promise, Here's what we read. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John with them and led them up a high mountain where they were all alone. There he was transfigured before them. His clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. And there appeared before Elijah, before them Elijah and Moses who were talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it's good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Verse 6, he did not know what to say. They were so frightened. Then in verse 7, a cloud appeared and enveloped them, and a voice came from the cloud, This is my son, whom I love. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus. Wow, what's, what's happening here? Well, Jesus promised his disciples that some of them were going to see the glory and power of God and the kingdom. They were going to get to see that before they died. And then six days later, he invites Peter, James, and John to go up this mountain. Now, this mountain is Mount Hermon, right next there in the valley of Caesarea Philippi, where they were just back in chapter 8. This mountain is 9,000 feet high. It always has snow on the peak. So why is Jesus only inviting these three? Well, it's because he's wanting to show them something. He's wanting to give them a glimpse of who he really is. The Bible says that he was transfigured right before their very eyes, which means that he was showing them some of the godness of who he is. Remember, who is Jesus? He's the son of God. He's God in the flesh. He's fully man, and he's fully God. He's explained it before, but now here, they're getting to experience it firsthand. And if you're a note taker here this morning, I want you to write down this first simple idea about the highs and lows of life. Point number one there in your notes, the highest highs in life will be with Jesus. The highest highs that you will ever experience will always be with Jesus. Now, if you're a Christian here today, you might be thinking, oh, come on, Steve, why would you even say that? Because listen, me, I've traveled the whole world. I've seen some of the most amazing sunrises and sunsets. I've tasted some of the most incredible food. I've experienced a marriage and the birth of children. I've achieved so many accomplishments in my career. I've earned so many degrees. I've experienced such amazing highs, Steve. So why would I even need to know Jesus? Well, listen, it's because when you know Jesus, then you know the one who actually made that sun that rises and sets. When you know Jesus, you know the one who provided that meal for you. When you know Jesus, then you recognize the source of all those beautiful high moments. And you recognize that God's blessing is on you in those moments. Because he's, ex- he's created you to experience his glory. Amen? When we know Jesus, we know the source of all good things. So no matter what physical, emotional, or even spiritual high you could ever have, knowing Jesus makes it so much greater. And he is transfigured right before them. 
It's this whole idea of intimacy. Jesus is saying, into me, see. I'm going to pull back the veil of my flesh. That's what the word revelation actually means. It means to unveil. I want to show you something that I've been talking about. Peter, you said it just last week. I'm the son of the living God, and now I want to show you what that looks like. It's a sneak peek into his deity. And then it says that he's talking with Moses and Elijah there on the mountain. What, what in the world would Moses and Elijah be doing there? Well, Moses, remembers a picture of the law. He's the one that gave the people the Ten Commandments. And Elijah is a picture of the prophets, all the prophets that God has sent. So for centuries, Moses and Elijah, the law and the prophets, have been pointing to somebody who'd be the Messiah. And now, we just read, Jesus is actually talking with them. He's having a conversation with them. And as they're talking, then a cloud descends on the mountain. If you're familiar with the Hebrew scriptures, then you know that every time that a cloud would descend, it was the manifest presence of God himself. When a cloud would descend on the tabernacle, for example, Moses would get to talk to God face to face, the Bible says, like a man talks to his friend. Then when the cloud would descend on the temple of Solomon, the priests wouldn't be able to do their work. It was thick with the glory of God. And then here, the cloud descends on the mountain as if God was saying, my manifest presence is here with my son. Now, here's the question in my mind anyway. What do you think they were talking about? What do you think Moses and Elijah were talking to Jesus about? Well, listen, there's a real simple principle that I hope you embrace. And it's the fact that the very best way to interpret the Bible is actually with the Bible. Amen? The best commentary on the Bible is always the Bible itself. And this transfiguration story wasn't just recorded by Mark. It was also recorded by Matthew in chapter 17 and by Luke in chapter 9. And there we get some extra commentary on this account. In fact, Matthew said that Jesus' face shined like the sun. And Luke noted that Peter, James, and John, they were actually falling asleep right before this happened. How many of you have ever missed something almost because you were falling asleep, right? How many of you are falling asleep in church, right? You can nudge that person beside you. Brett, it's time to wake up. Luke also records that Moses and Elijah were talking to Jesus about his departure that was to come. It says they were talking about the mission that he was about to fulfill. Remember, Moses didn't get to fulfill his mission, did he? Neither did Elijah. But here, they're talking with Jesus about his departure. Literally, that word means exodus. But they're talking about also how he was going to defeat death and rise again. I don't know, that would have been an amazing conversation, would it not? Now, listen, here's a really cool side note. Do you know that, do you remember that Moses was the guy who couldn't enter the promised land because he struck that rock? Do you guys remember that story? Well, guess where Moses is right now? Mount Hermon. This Mount of Transfiguration is right in the middle of the Promised Land. In other words, because of Jesus, Moses did, in fact, make it to the Promised Land. And the very same thing is true for you as well. If you're with Jesus, you're going to end up in the Promised Land. That's just a word to remind you that no matter what your failure is, no matter your mistakes or your regrets, if you're with Jesus, you will be in the Promised Land. And so in the middle of this moment, Peter interrupts. He says, hey, let's build three shelters here. You need to know Peter's the guy who just say anything. Something's got to fly out of his mouth, even when he doesn't know what to say. Do you know anybody like that? Or maybe you're that person that just has to fill the silence with words. Well, keep in mind that Mark, remember, he's interviewing Peter here. He's writing down everything that Peter has to say. So it's kind of like when they get to this part, he asks Peter, hey, when you said let's build three shelters, that was kind of a dumb thing to say, wasn't it? I mean... Well, why did you say that? Peter's like, dude, I, I admit I was terrified. I had no idea what to say. And then Peter said it was kind of like I was trying to put Moses and Elijah on the same plane as the son of God who actually made Moses and Elijah. So yeah, duh, wasn't one of my finest moments there. But thankfully, Peter says, right after I said that, God interrupted from heaven and said, this is my son whom I love. Listen to him. It's almost like God was saying, Peter, shh, be quiet here. Listen to Jesus, okay? Peter's having a pretty rough week here, isn't he? I mean, earlier in the week, he'd been rebuked by Jesus, the Son of God. Remember what he said? Get behind me, Satan. And here in the very same week, he's rebuked by the Father's voice from heaven. If you're keeping score at home, Peter is 0 for 2 right now. Coming off a really bad week. 
And if you're coming off a bad week as well, that means you should be encouraged because you're in good company. God can still totally use your life. Now, listen, I just love how the Bible is the living and active word of God. So what we're reading today isn't just some history lesson. The fact is clear. When you hear God say, this is my son, listen to him, that is a word for you and me here today. Whether you're a Christian here or not, if God could say absolutely anything to you today, that's what he would say. This is my son, whom I love, listen to him. Even if you just took the red letters of your Bible and just lived by them, if you actually listen to Jesus instead of your own heart and your own mind and actually put his words into practice, your, your whole life would be completely different. We say that around here all the time. A relationship with Jesus changes everything. Now, what does that mean? Well, it doesn't mean that everything's going to go like you'd want it to go. No, it means that he's going to form and reform your heart and mind around the things that are true, the things that he sees, which is far better than anything you could ever do for yourself. This is my son whom I love. Listen to him. And so they're having this amazing moment, this high, high moment. But now in verse 9, they're actually going to have to come down the mountain. Let's read it together. Mark 9, 9. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus gave them orders not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. They kept the matter to themselves, discussing what rising from the dead meant. And they asked him, why do the teachers of the law say that Elijah must come first? Jesus replied, verse 12, to be sure, Elijah does come first and restores all things. Why then is it written that the Son of Man must suffer much and be rejected? But I tell you, Elijah has come, and they have done to him everything they wished, just as it is written about him. So now they're on their way down the mountain. And please note that Jesus is the one who is leading them down the mountain which gives us another very important principle to absorb, and not just intellectually, but with our heart as well. You could write it down this way. Point number two there in your notes, spiritual highs will not last forever. Spiritual highs won't last forever. They just won't. But oftentimes, we want them to, don't they? We want to stay right there, up there on that mountaintop. Let's just stay right here. Let's build a shelter. That was Peter's instinctive response. I want to stay right here. I don't want to budge at all. I just want to live here in the glory of God. In fact, let's create a retreat center. Let's invite people up. It could be an incredible thing. Try to imagine what's going through the mind of a person who wants to stay up on that spiritual mountaintop. After all, they've got this great view. It's understandable why they don't want to come down because they've had this great moment, maybe even a tremendous breakthrough. Maybe it was a tremendous experience in church on Sunday, so much so that they don't want to go back to work on Monday. But Jesus is saying, no, 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 let's go, guys. That was certainly an important moment for your formation as a disciple. But now, listen, now we're going to go back down the mountain. And as they head back down, he says, oh, and by the way, I'm going to suffer and I'm going to die. So after that euphoric mountaintop experience, Jesus now talks to them about dying. I'm guessing they're still trying to process everything that's happened so far. Now, you and me, we know the end of the story. But for them, this is the first time they began to grapple with this idea that he was going to have to suffer and die. And not only that, but he was going to rise again. So understandably so, they've got all kinds of questions. You see, the closer that Jesus gets to the cross, the less and less the disciples actually understand him. The closer that he gets to suffering, the less that his plan fits with their plan. And the same thing is true with us. When Jesus starts talking about suffering and difficulty, it really doesn't jive with the way that we want our lives to be as we long for another mountaintop experience. He tells them that John the Baptist has, in fact, come already in the spirit and power of Elijah. He's already been the forerunner. And now he says, now I'm here. He's trying to help them grasp all of this. And listen, although we certainly can't stay on top of the mountain, that doesn't mean that those powerful mountaintop experiences shouldn't leave a deep impression on our lives. Impressions that we can reflect on and actually allow them to give us courage in the future. Because now 50 years after this moment, John and Peter, who were there, they both wrote about it. In fact, many of you remember as John the Apostle was writing his gospel, what did he say? As he was reflecting on this moment, he said, and in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, 
And the word was God. And the word made his dwelling among us. And then he said this. He said, and we have seen his glory. In other words, we've seen the Shekinah glory of the one and only son of God. And it totally changed his life. And it helped him to be able to tell his Jesus story. And now Peter here, Peter would write this 50 years after that moment to a persecuted church, to men and women who were being killed for their faith, and to a church that was filled with false doctrine and division. You could read it for yourself. It's 2 Peter. It was his last letter. He wrote it just months before he himself would be crucified upside down. He would die with his wife martyred because of the Roman persecution. Listen to what he wrote in his last letter. It's 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 16 through 18. He said, We did not follow cleverly invented stories when we told you about the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For we received honor and glory from God the Father when the voice came to him from the majestic glory, saying, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Peter said, We heard this voice ourselves that came from heaven and we were with him there on that sacred mountain in other words peter's saying no matter what you're going through in life right now even if you have to die i want you to know that we didn't make this story up i saw it with my own two eyes i heard it with my own two ears and it changed me into the person i am today he's telling the church to be courageous he's saying church listen jesus is who he says he is i saw his glory You see, there's something about reflecting back on those high, high moments in life that really give us faith and courage when we have to go back down into the valley. So take a moment and reflect right now. Can you think of a time where Jesus revealed to you his power, his glory, his love for you? Maybe it was the day you placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, the day you became a Christian. I vividly remember the day I was baptized. I also can't help but think of the day that Kelly and I were married right here on this stage. I remember each of the days that my kids were born. I don't think I'll ever forget the first sermon I preached right here. It really wasn't very good at all, but it was a whole lot shorter than they are now. I'll tell you that, on the plus side. I'll also never forget all the people who've responded to the altar calls over the years, to the invitations at the end of each service, because somehow the Holy Spirit was using my feeble words to completely change other people's eternities. The Apostle Paul says, we're like jars of clay that through us flow the all-surpassing power of God. Maybe for you, it was a healing. Regardless, we need to allow those high moments in life to shape our hearts. But it's important that you understand, we can't chase those highs because now we're going to see jesus walk them down the mountain he's going to walk them into the valley right into the middle of a chaotic argument in this fight we're going to see the teachers of the law we're going to see the nine disciples that he left behind as well as this man who's desperate for his demon possessed son to be healed and jesus is going to walk them right into the middle of that chaos verse 14 When they came to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd around them and the teachers of the law arguing with them. As soon as all the people saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with wonder and ran to greet him. What are you arguing with them about, he asked. A man in the crowd answered, Teacher, I brought you my son who is possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. Oh, unbelieving generation, Jesus replied in verse 19, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. Wow, that's, that's quite the jolting change, is it not? I mean, one minute you have the glory of God, the power of God, and the voice from heaven, and now here you have absolute chaos. And stop to think about the powerlessness. I mean, the disciples have healed before. They've cast out demons before, but here they're powerless to help this little boy and his dad. The dad himself is also powerless. He's tried everything to help his son. And if you're a parent, you know what that's like. You know that you would do absolutely anything to help them, but there's nothing that they could do. Jesus, he doesn't lack power at all. Now, whenever he walks onto the scene, he can do absolutely anything he wants to do. But there's also this longing that he has for them. Guys, you know my power. 
how long do I have to stay with you? And then he just says, bring the boy to me. Now look at verse 20. So they brought him. When the spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. He fell to the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. Verse 21, Jesus asked the boy's father, how long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered, it has often thrown him into fire or water to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. If you can, Jesus said, everything is possible for him who believes. Immediately, the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. When Jesus saw that a crowd was running to the scene, he rebuked the evil spirit. You deaf and mute spirit, he said, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. The spirit shrieked, convulsed him violently and came out. The boy looked so much like a corpse that many said, he's dead. Okay, so this is, this is another one of those crazy scenes. You know how we always say that Jesus changes everything? Well, he's certainly changed things in this moment, hasn't he? And sometimes it could seem like Jesus is kind of insensitive here. I mean, if you look at the scene, the father says that this boy has been like this for a long time. There's so much pain in his heart. But even as this boy is convulsing on the ground and foaming at the mouth, Jesus asks this dad, how long has he been like this? Right there in the middle of this seizure, this dad's heart had to be breaking, thinking, oh no, here we go again. So why do you think Jesus asked that question? How long has he been like this? Well, it's because Jesus isn't interested in just solving a problem or just healing this issue that's been in the boy's life for so long now. No, he's interested in something more. He's actually interested in having a relationship with this father and a relationship with this son. So it's like Jesus is saying, hey, tell me your story. Tell me how long. Tell me how much pain. Tell me how much fear as a dad. Tell me about the disappointments you've had with God as you've wrestled with those doubts. Jesus doesn't want to just walk away from here with a father and son who's restored. He doesn't want to walk away with just this healing of this chronic condition that's been plaguing them for so long now. No, he also wants to walk away with a relationship with them. That, that's why he's focused on them like that. Likewise, if you've walked in here today and you have pain, Maybe you came in today, you just want to get rid of some guilt or you want God to deliver you from some bondage that's just owned your life. Listen, before you ask Jesus to do those things for you, what if you just let him ask you the question, how long have you been this way? And again, maybe that sounds like a cruel question to you. But friend, please understand, it's not that Jesus doesn't know the answer. He totally does. He's just trying to draw you in. He's trying to bring that to the surface. And as this father struggles with his faith and with his doubt, Jesus casts out this demon. But now, as we just read, it actually looks like things have gotten so much worse because it looks like the boy is dead, which leads us to a simple principle I'll ask you to write down. Point number three there in your notes. When Jesus intervenes, it often gets worse before it gets better. I found this to be true so often in life. Things can get worse before they get better. Jesus delivers this boy, but now, now he looks like a corpse. So it's way worse than it was before. But you know what? Especially when you stop to think about the people that we read about in Scripture, you'll often see that when you're in bondage, in order to experience freedom, oftentimes it gets worse before it gets better. Like the people of Israel. They'd been in slavery for 400 years. They'd been praying for a deliverer, and God sent Moses to them. And when Moses went to Pharaoh and said, let my people go, what did Pharaoh say? Pharaoh says, now I'm going to make them work even harder. More bricks, no straw. So it gets way worse right before the deliverance. So the question is, are you willing to walk through that short-term pain in order to experience freedom? The long-term goal of what it means to find freedom in the gospel. Truth be told, if we're honest, a lot of people would just say no. No. To that short-term pain and just never experience deliverance. So the question becomes, what do you do in those low moments where you're just grinding and pressing through? What happens in your mind when things look like they've gotten so much worse? Like, man, see, I gave my life to Jesus and now my whole life is just blowing up. Or in our mind, when we hear that a relationship with Jesus changes everything, what we think is life's going to be nothing but lucky charms and Skittles from here on out, right? Christian, listen, that might make for good 
a good self-help book. But I got to be honest, that's not the gospel. The gospel says you must deny yourself and you take up your cross and you follow Jesus. The gospel says there's going to be some really difficult moments in life where you're going to have to press through. You're going to have to fight these difficult battles and temptations that you've never experienced before. But listen, God is so faithful to use that time to form you and mold you and shape you into a completely new person. But make no mistake, if you're going to follow Jesus, it is going to be difficult. Parts of your life are going to blow up. But if you'll walk through that process, listen, something beautiful will happen. In my own testimony, I tell you, I'm having more fun than I've ever had before. My relationships are deeper than they've ever been. God has given me the wife and kids I have now is this beautiful, amazing gift. Jesus loves to do stuff like that all the time as he renovates your heart down in the valley. But I also want you to think about the very real temptation to just quit when you're in the valley. Think about what goes through your head when you're down in the valley. Like when you're in the valley, if you're there, when you're looking up at the mountain, especially, there's this tendency to think, man, I just want to go back up there. I want to go back up the mountain. I mean, even after their deliverance, the children of Israel, do you remember? They wanted to go back to Egypt. So one of the most dangerous things we can do is to look back to the mountain with some sense of nostalgia. We should never be the kind of Christians who look back to a moment in the past and say, oh man, it was really good back then. Or, oh, you know, that one experience I had at that other church like 10, 20, 30 years ago. And you hold on to it so much so that that's all you think about. And now you're totally disengaged in the present. You're not pressing on toward the future. Instead, you're just sitting there thinking about that mountaintop experience you had way back when. Now you're paralyzed and you don't even realize it. You can't see how disengaged you are from what God wants to do in your life today. For some people in the valley, they want to try to create artificial highs. They chase physical highs like a meal or a party or a vacation. They want to feel really good, so they just try to generate those highs. But it can also be spiritual highs. I watch Christians all the time chase spiritual highs, some concert, some podcast, some prayer meeting, this church or that church, all because they want to try to experience that euphoric feeling of being up on the mountaintop again. Or for some in the valley, they just try to medicate their feelings away. They drink that drink or they take that drug to try to numb the real feelings they have so they don't have to experience the dissonance or the disappointment. So the question is, what do you do with those honest feelings that you have in the valley? Well, friend, here's what I want you to know. God is the one who made both the mountains and the valley. He's at work in both places. In fact, stop to think about it. Where does the fruit grow anyway? The fruit only grows in the valley, not up on the mountaintop. Fruit only grows in the valley. And it's down in this valley that this father is wrestling with all these feelings. I mean, you can hear it. He says something that describes the tension that's experienced by every single person who's ever read the Bible since. He says, I believe and help me overcome my unbelief. There's this tension between faith and doubt, between hope and anxiety. And this guy is stuck right in the middle. So he asked Jesus to help him believe, even down in the valley. And Jesus says, everything is possible for him who believes. Remember, friend, it's not a matter of how much faith you have. Remember, it's who you have faith in that matters. You could totally have faith in yourself and still live a disastrous life. But if you have even just a little bit of faith in Jesus Christ, he can change everything in your life. That's just who he is. Amen? Henry Nouwen, who was such a great author of what it means to think and feel and trust Jesus in the difficult times, listen to what he wrote. I think this quote is appropriate for this moment. He said, your whole life is filled with losses, endless losses. And every time there are losses, there are choices to be made. You choose to live your losses as passages to anger, blame, hatred, depression, a resentment, or you choose to let those losses be passages to something new, something wider, something deeper. So the question is not how to avoid loss and make it not ever happen, but how to choose it as a passage, as an exodus to greater life and freedom. 
the father took all of those losses and he placed his faith in Jesus. It became a passage for him to see the world in a whole new way and a passage to a whole new relationship, both with his son and with God. The disciples, they experienced Jesus in a whole new way as well. I mean, they thought they knew how to cast out a demon, but they learned in their weakness that Jesus was teaching them something completely different. Far too often in our Christianese language, we'll say things like, well, I'm, I'm going through a season of high right now up on the mountaintop, or I'm going through a season of low down in the valley. We talk about those things like there are two separate events. But in reality, for most of life, the highs and lows all happen in the very same day. The experiences that we've studied about today all happened in the same 24-hour period. The disciples had one of the most euphoric highs that they've ever experienced with Jesus up on the mountain, and then one of the worst lows that they've ever experienced all in the same day. So the question is, what is Jesus doing in the highs and the lows of our lives? Well, you could write it down this way, fourth and finally, there in your notes, Jesus will use highs and lows to transform you, to mold you and shape you in order to make you more like him. Now, the disciples have a question. Take a look at verse 27. There we read, but Jesus took the little boy by the hand and lifted him to his feet, and he stood up. After Jesus had gone indoors, his disciples asked him privately, why couldn't we drive it out? He replied, this kind could come out only by prayer. Some of your Bibles say by prayer and fasting. In other words, Jesus is saying, guys, listen, this was a spiritual battle, and you came without spiritual weapons. There was a spiritual process of discernment that they didn't have yet. You see, the disciples had cast out demons, and they'd healed before, and they were just trying to use those very same methods that they'd used in the past, but they weren't working here, which is a cautionary tale for you and me. It's the very same reason that Moses didn't get, her, get to enter the promised land initially. Remember what happened to him? He had a rod. He hit the rock with it, just like he did before, but that wasn't what God wanted him to do. Far too often, we come with a certain formula for the way we think that life works or the way that we've been successful in the past, and we only use that one tool that we have in the toolbox, and we use it the same way that we always have. But God's saying, no, 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 no. I want you to approach that new problem in a different way. He says, I want you to use some discernment. Maybe in your life right now, you have a problem that you need power and wisdom and help with. But maybe you've just been attacking that problem in the same way that you've addressed issues in the past. But now, now it's not working. Well, friend, listen, if that describes you, I want to encourage you to pray and fast and say, God, I think I know what I ought to do. But I'm, I'm just going to pray, and I'm just going to fast, and I'm going to ask you to give me spiritual eyes to see how I might address this issue with your strength, through your eyes, with your love. Church, what would happen if we all did that? What would happen if we addressed our problems with prayer and fasting? Now, quickly, I want to close with a story about the Apostle Paul. It's a story that's told about him that, that it's probably the one that's most frequently told. Back when he was Saul riding on his horse on the way to Damascus to actually arrest and kill Christians. He himself told this story over and over again. It was the day that was both the highest and lowest point of his life. It was the day that Jesus knocked him off his high horse and blinded him. And then opened his eyes again, setting him on a completely new mission. As Paul followed Jesus, he would later write this in Philippians 3, verse 10. He said, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. In other words, Paul is saying that he didn't want to avoid the highs and lows of life. Instead, he wanted them to shape his heart to know Jesus more and to be known by Jesus. Again, it's all about a relationship with Jesus. Then later in that same chapter, Paul said that our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Oh, church, that's our blessed hope, that the transfiguration that happened to Jesus will one day happen to you and me, that our lowly bodies will be transformed to be just like Jesus. And that's incredibly good news, especially if your body is wasting away right now. Listen, you're going to get a new body. You're going to get to see Jesus in all of his glory. 
And as the Christian church, we place our faith and our trust in Jesus Christ. And that a relationship with him changes everything. Amen? Amen. Let's close in prayer together. Father God, we thank you that our citizenship is in heaven. And that through the highs and lows of life that you're there. And you're at work in us, forming our hearts to be more like your son, Jesus. Lord, please have your way here today. Reveal yourself to us in new and deeper ways. Help us to surrender to your good and perfect and pleasing will. And then transform us as only you can. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hey, listen, before we close our time in song together, I just want to extend a simple invitation to you today. Maybe you feel like you've been stuck in the valley for a a long time now. Listen, friend, I'd love to just pray with you. Not that he would immediately take you out of that valley, at least not before he shows you the fruit that he's wanting to produce in you first. And maybe for you, all this is new to you. You've never placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Friend, he totally wants to transform your life today. The Bible says, repent and be baptized. Today is the day of salvation. Or maybe you do believe. But your prayer, like so many others, is, Lord, help me overcome my unbelief. Or maybe you're an immersed believer who wants to officially become a member of this church. Listen, whatever your need, here's your opportunity. I'm going to invite you to please come forward as we stand and sing this closing song together right now. Please come. Storms may 
Thanks again for listening today. We'd love to hear from you. If you'd like more information about our church or if you just want to share what God's been doing in your life, drop us a line. Give us a call. Again, may God bless you.